Hey everybody, Darren Boros here. Uh, today I'm with my friend Kyle Ford and I wanted to bring Kyle on because he brings such a unique skill set uh, to the equation. He is a savvy real estate investor. He's also a mortgage broker and he used to be a financial advisor. And I wanted to bring Kyle on to talk specifically about uh, that world because I think there's so many people, uh, especially Canadians, that we have a lot of investing options. And we're not sure what to do with our money in a lot of cases. And so we turn to a financial advisor to look for them to give us assistance. And I think the system uh, you know, doesn't end up uh, producing the kind of results that people are hoping for in a lot of cases. And so I wanted to talk to Kyle about a lot of the ins and outs of that system. And he can break things down for us uh, because he's really an expert in this area. So uh, Kyle, thanks so much for being here today. Um, I'll let you give yourself a little bit of int an introduction. So please uh, tell us who you are and what you do. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Darren. Excited to be on here. Um, yeah, so I've been investing in real estate for uh, seven years now. Uh, I've, especially, I've done all types of investing from single family homes, flipping, multifamily, uh, vacation rentals, private lending, uh, really the, the full gamut there. Uh, it's, today's, today I focus on large multifamily, uh, private lending, as well as vacation rentals. Um, when I started off uh, investing in real estate, uh, I was uh, an independent financial advisor with a major insurance company here in Canada. Throughout that process, I started being attracted to real estate. Um, and in, as of January 1st, 2018, uh, which was six years in the business for me, I sold my financial business to focus solely on real estate. So that's kind of the, the Coles notes of who I am and, and, and my background. Awesome. And what was, the, what was the catalyst, I guess, for making the change from you know, being a financial advisor over into the real estate world? Well, so here, I, I want to start with saying this. First of all, I'm not a financial advisor anymore. So anything in this conversation that we talk about can't be perceived as financial advice. Yeah. So just an opinion. The, the kind of catalyst for me is, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't happy with what I saw. Yeah. I, you know, there was, as an independent advisor, I was working a lot with friends and family. And, you know, I, I felt like I was doing a good job, but I would still go to a family dinner and funds would be down because somebody farted in Egypt. <laughs> right. I've done everything right. I, I you know, I've been, I've been on top of my meetings. I've been rebalancing the funds. I've been, you know, you know, paying attention to their needs and, and, and but yet their money's still down. So I really felt a, a lack of control and the ability to give people predictable, consistent results. Uh, and when we look at what's happened in the market in the past couple of weeks, I'm certainly glad to not be involved in that sector sector anymore. Yeah. And, and I want to put a bit of a disclaimer out there too, because it's not that I have anything against uh, financial advisors. When I started looking into this and started realizing, you know, cause I'd been working with a financial advisor for years and I had my money parked with them. And I was just wondering, because I kept seeing these things on my statement, you know, like you've been making a seven or eight or 10% return. And I was like, well, and why is my money not growing at that similar type rate? And I just really didn't quite understand it. I really always want to know how everything works. And then you know, because if I know how everything works, then I can make decisions based on what I really want to do and how I want to achieve my goals. And that's sort of why I wanted to have you on and we could talk specifics about these to this type of scenario. And that's what I found is when I was making those recommendations to people, looking in hindsight, it, at the time, I felt like I was doing the right thing. My, my directors, my branch managers, all those people who were telling me to, to sell our products, I genuinely thought I was doing the right thing. But when I look back now, the recommendations that I was being told to made, make were often not necessarily the best thing for the client, maybe the best thing for our bonus structure and how we got paid. It was really about, you know, understanding that your financial advisor may not be making the best recommendation based on your needs, but more about what product they have available to sell. Finishing that thought here, I want to piggyback with what you said. There are tons of great financial advisors out there, great financial planners, people who genuinely care. So there's lots of good ones, but there are a lot of people that are, have the title financial advisor that are really just a trained salesperson. It takes longer to get your hair, hairdressing license than it does to get your, um, your IFIC or your CSC. So what are the qualifications? Like if I walk into a, a branch of a big fin financial institution here in Canada, what are the people that are financial advisors that what kind of qualifications do they have? They could have a CSC, so the Canadian Securities course, they could have an IFIC, which is a mutual fund sales license, uh, LLQP, which is an insurance sales license. Um, those can be some of the, the more general, broader ones that the financial advisor at the big green comfy couch or the yellow dragon, uh, as we'll avoid saying names, that those are some of the qualifications they have. If you're going to be working with somebody, you know, look for a financial planner. 
the CFP, Certified Financial Planner. Okay. They have a fiduciary responsibility to their clients. They're going to have the ability to do planning for you, um, actually map out a true financial plan. And maybe that plan could involve real estate. What kind of products are financial advisors who don't have a lot of training are likely to put you in? Generally mutual funds. Why is it mutual funds are so popular in this space? You know, I, I saw an article uh, a friend of mine uh, uses and he says mutual funds are like donuts and hockey to Canadians. They just, they just are. <laughs> they're easy to sell. They, they have all the right buzzwords, right? They're diversified. They're, they're balanced. They, they have a little bit of everything. So if one part goes up, another part, another one part goes down, another part can go up. There, you know, there are some, you know, solid mutual funds out there, but as a whole, a mutual fund is going to have embedded fees built into them, which over time is going to start eroding your rates of return. And what do those fees look like? Like what, what is an average fee on a mutual fund that somebody's paying to work with, uh, you know, a financial advisor? Uh, yeah, I'll throw a number out at 2%. Uh, there's some ETF funds at 1% or sub 1%. Uh, if you get into some segregated funds, segregated funds are insurance policy. Uh, they have death benefits built into your investment. Those can be closer to 3%. 2% doesn't sound like a big number, right? When you hear 2%, okay, well, 2% is not bad. Well, if you're earning 6% that year, 2% is, is 30% of your return gone. Right. And correct me if I'm wrong, it's regardless of whether that fund goes up or whether it goes down, there's still that 2% being earned by the financial advisor. Uh, absolutely. Your, your funds, they, your fee was taken... Last month, it's going to be taken again this month, and I don't think anyone's in the black on their funds right now. <laughs> it's been a so, tough month for everybody. I mean, real month. estate also, you know, it's not been an easy month for real estate investors. We've all been talking about the struggles that we've been dealing with our tenants and all that kind of stuff. But I think, you know, more so than that, the, the definitely the, the portfolios that I've got in terms of my investments in the market have definitely taken a much larger hit for sure. So you mentioned the fees around 2%. Are there, like, how do I, I, I just look at my financial statements and I can't see anywhere. And I know there was new rules introduced recently about, you know, the disclosure of those fees. Are there things that we're not seeing on those documents or are there things that they kind of hide in the fine print that we're like, where are they disclosing that, that fee? They're between hieroglyph A and C. <laughs> You know, I worked for a, with an education, uh, a real estate education company the past couple of years. And at those events, we've, uh, people bring in statements and they say, hey, can you, can you help me with these? And I'll be honest with you, since they've become more clear to read, I struggle to read them more than I used to be able to because it's not clear. Right. I don't, you know, that, that, that's a personal opinion of mine. Um, and, and maybe I'm missing something in my, my, my two and a half years out of the business now. But these statements are, become, are, are quite difficult to read. They have their adjusted cost basis, their book value, their market value. And at the end of the day, most people are just looking at one thing. How much did I put in? How much do I have? And they're not happy with that spread. You want to know for certain exactly what your fees are, how they're being calculated. And if, if you need to ask, have your advisor tell you specifically, what, what were my annual fees charged this year? Well, if they say it's on your statement, can you tell me in an email clearly how much were my fees? Because I, I, I can't read it. Is there a, is there a self-directed option that we can do in terms of working with a financial advisor? Like, is, it can, can I work with you as a financial advisor and then say, I want to pick, you know, these uh, mutual funds, these uh, stocks. Is, is there a lesser fee for that? Or is that just a, simply a service that you provide, but then you can choose? And that's kind of where I go back to work with a financial planner. Right. So if you're working with a financial planner, you can negotiate fee for service. So say, look, I'm going to pay you a flat rate for a year to monitor my financial plan, give your opinion on different things, but I want to be, I'm picking my stocks. I'm going to use my equity to buy real estate and I want you to help project me and map out a retirement plan, but I'm not looking for you to be taking a percentage of my rate of return. I just want to pay you X amount of dollars per year, monitor my plan. And there are, those planners do exist, but they are few and far between. Uh, in terms of, if you're going to the big banks, you're going to the major insurance companies, for the most part, they're going to be more of a, a built-in model on MERs. What, you know, what would be your advice now, uh, looking back, like if you could change things in, in your uh, own portfolio, or I guess maybe a better question is, what do you do in your own portfolio? Because I'm guessing you're diversified. You're not all uh, invested in real estate. 
Um, so what would be a recommendation now, knowing what you know on the real estate side and on the financial planning side, what would be your best advice to anybody sort of getting into the space for the first time? Part, going back to one of the reasons why I got out of the business is I wholeheartedly believe that you cannot get wealthy giving your money to somebody else to manage. You need to take an active role in that. Now, that doesn't mean you couldn't take a JV working partner. Yeah. Or you, 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 you have a partnership like that. But to hand some, I don't know anybody who's gotten wealthy on mutual funds. Right. I know wealthy people who have put a lot of money into mutual funds, mm -hmm. but not actually made that. They're, they owned a business, they sold the business, they put it in. The, the number one advice I can give to people in general is you have to take control of your own finances. That doesn't mean you can't have an advisory board, you know, have a great account, have a, a lawyer, a mortgage broker, a real estate coach, and all those people there to, to help you and support you. But you need to be the CEO of your financial plan. So what is the best thing that I can do when I've got RSPs, TFSAs, in your opinion? Where, where do you, what, what do you do with those funds when you have them available? So on the, working as an independent mortgage broker now, I work, with, uh, I work with clients all the time who have taken those funds from the traditional financial institutions, for traditional financial instruments, and self-directed them to invest in real estate. So what they're doing is they're, they're primarily lending on mortgages. Yeah. So they're using their, the RRSP can become its own lender and lend the funds to, uh, as a mortgage on a property. Now there's some rules and guidelines there. So for the most part, you want to be doing arm's length mortgages. So that's lending to somebody not related to you by blood, marriage, or adoption. So for example, Darren, if I had, if I had a hundred thousand dollars in my RRSP, and I wanted to lend a second mortgage to you to do renovations, I can lend it from the RRSP. Now, all the returns have to be paid back into the RRSP, yep. uh, but it still gives you a fixed return with real security um, in, inside your RRSP. So the question I hear a lot of when people start to talk about, you know, investing their RRSPs into real estate, because I've worked in this, in this space a lot, you know, borrowed uh, from other people, and been paying them anywhere from 10 to 15% return on their money. And when I talk to people that are not used to working inside of this space, they're like, well, this must be a super high risk loan if I'm looking at anywhere between 10 and 15%. I know that that's not necessarily the case, but what would be your sort of, uh, you know, talking point to that, if you will, of, of how there is security and maybe even more security in real estate than there is in the financial markets? We've been trained by our financial system to believe that to get a higher rate of return, you have to take more risk, <laughs> right? And, and I know everybody watching this at home finished that sentence as well, because that's how we've been trained. Let me ask you this. Do the banks take your money and put it in their account? Then do they lend it on mortgages? Mm -hmm. So why is it risky when we do it? What's the security on your investment today? In a, so, in a mutual fund, for instance. Nothing. Yeah. There's security. There is none. There's no security yeah. there. Now, if we're going to invest in a mortgage, we're going to lend a mortgage to, to myself or to you. We're, we have a, a secured, registered mortgage or lien, depending on the language you want to use, on that property. Which means, so for example, I'm lending to you, Darren. Darren, you don't make your payment. I'm now, what does the bank do when you don't make the payment? They foreclose on the property. Mm -hmm. I'm in the exact same position. Now, is there risk involved in this? Absolutely. If, if you're lending at 100% loan to value and the market drops, you could be in a position where you're, you're underwater. Yeah. Now, that's where you could have a personal guarantee from the borrower that you could go after other assets, but I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. When you're lending a mortgage, you have a, a, a secured position on the property. I'm using the terminology second mortgage, but for, I do them all the time with first mortgages, where it's an investor who's buying a property they're gonna convert it to a duplex. They use an RRSP mortgage to buy the property, they pay the investor 10%, and then six months later, they refinance with the big red bank. Pay back so, the investor inside their back. RRSP. You know, the, and, and I think to be clear too, no, no, the money's n never coming out of the structure of an RRSP, so there's no fees to be paid, right? It still stays in that structure. It's still a tax deferred investment that you're gonna to have to eventually pay tax on later on in life whenever you take that money out. 
but it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a great way to make significantly higher returns inside of the real estate market, for instance, than inside the money market. Going back to that example of the duplex conversion, when you refinance, what does that look like? Well, if, if you were lending me that money, you were registered in first position, which means when I go to get my new mortgage, I can't register that mortgage without paying you back. So it's a secure position on the property. And in those scenarios, if you're the borrower and you pay the investor back, what, do, what does the next step look like? Well, my guess is everybody's going to want to do it again. Right. The investor just got 10%. I just did a successful burr or flip to yourself on that property. So what does the next step look like? It looks like we're all going to do this again. And then outside of RSP, there's also TFSA, right? Which is a whole other, I mean, it's essentially the same rules, correct? In terms of the, yeah, in terms of the registered restrictions to, to lend, yes. But in terms of return on the TFSA side, it's tax-free. So anything you make inside of that tax-free savings account, you can essentially take uh, and use at your leisure. We, we use the term RRSP, but Liras, RIFs, the, the, the big one I hear is my RRSP is locked in. So that's locked in, which means you can't take it out now. But we're not talking about taking money out of your RRSP. We're talking about investing within your RRSP in non-traditional investments. The best example I can give about this, as we start talking about it, some people might get a little bit confused, is if I have an RRSP and I have a Coca-Cola stock in my RRSP, is my money in my RRSP? No, technically it's in Coca-Cola, right? It's in Coca-Cola's bank yeah. account. Yeah. My stock in my RRSP, all the dividends, all the returns, get paid back to my RRSP. A mortgage note is the exact same guidelines. So I have my, my money in my RRSP. I lend it to the borrower. The borrower's lawyer gives me a mortgage note to go back in my RRSP. All the returns get paid back. And when the deal closes, all the funds get paid back. Even though the funds are in somebody else's bank account, they're still registered in your RRSP. I love that explanation. It's super simple. And I think that's uh, really helpful. Obviously, being a mortgage broker, uh, being a real estate investor, you, you do this uh, all day, every day. I, I do. I, I, absolutely. And, I, and I'm happy to work with people on both sides, whether they're looking to borrow or whether they're looking to lend. Now, it's very important that everyone realizes when you're self-directing your RRSP, I'm not advising you what to invest your RRSP in. I'm simply presenting a lending opportunity. Right. Here's a mortgage. Do you want to put your money into it? Now, you as the lender, you can request whatever you want. Do you want an appraisal? Do you want a, a personal net worth statement from the borrower? Do you want your lawyer to review anything about the borrower? You could request blood, urine, and the firstborn child. I might not have as many deals for you, but as long as your guidelines are reasonable, um, you know, an appraisal, a net worth statement, and I want to see your 2018 NOA to make sure your taxes are paid today. That, that's a reasonable request that most of my borrowers are happy to fulfill on. Ultimately, it's up to the, you know, the lender, me, if I'm going to lend my RSPs out to vet the deal, right? It's not, that's not your job. That's my job as the, as the lender. You, you help as the act as the inter intermediary, but uh, essentially I'm looking at the loan to value. I'm looking at all those things and making a decision of whether I want to move forward on that transaction. A couple of the most important things is, you know, how long is the money going to be gone? How am I getting the money back? What's the exit strategy? Yeah. If a person can't clearly articulate to you how they're going to pay you back, the biggest benefit of doing these RRSP mortgages is you can really turn your money quickly and get the money compounded. So you don't want to be in these deals for long, long periods of time necessarily. There's pros and cons to both, but you want to be able to turn this money quickly. And if the, if the borrower can't clearly articulate to you how in the world they're going to pay you back, the fact that they've talked to their broker about being pre-approved to refinance, or they have the comparable sold data for a flip. Hey, we're going to flip this in six months. Look at all the data that supports why I'm going to sell this property within 30 days of listing. Why I'm going to get this price. If they can't articulate that stuff, as a lender, you might want to be a little bit more cautious of that. Kyle, thanks so much for being on today. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to leave your info on the screen here and also in the description below. So people want to contact you, they can get a hold of you. I look forward to talking with you more in the future about this kind of stuff. If you enjoyed the session today, if you don't mind, hit that like button. You can also subscribe to my channel. 
And with that, I'll say I wish everyone the best of success in your real estate investing journey. And I look forward to hearing your success stories very soon.